get the cookie and brownie before you sit down. So it's my uh, honor to introduce uh, Professor John Reynolds, and he a uh, professor of chemistry and biochemistry and material science engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And uh, John obtained his master uh, degree in science in 1982. Uh, and a PhD in 1984. And he have over 35 years of making conducting polymers, very different type of, uh, different type of uh, conducting polymer for variety of applications from uh, photochromic to uh, polymer like making dial, uh, solar cell, uh, you know, uh, and, and so on. So it's great to have uh, John here. So hopefully we can get it up. Thank you. That's quite an intro introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Quinn. All right. I think I'm set up. Sorry, I'm a couple minutes late, but I think we made it just in time, and I think everything is working. If that works, that's good. Okay, good. All right. So, yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and the opportunity to be here. To um, to talk, and I, I realize I'm being filmed today, so I'll try and be a bit careful with the words that I say because they may live on. No bad words, no. Bad words. no. Um, what I want to do today is I want to speak especially to students. I want to talk about conjugated polymers, of which there's been a huge amount of work here at UC Santa Barbara over many, many years. And so I think most of the people in the room are quite familiar with conjugated polymers. I'm going to give a little bit of introduction, especially some opinion in the beginning. And then what I'm going to do is use the redox activity and electrochromism, which has been a main focus of our work for many years, and charge storage basically as case studies for how we can control properties in these kinds of systems and see what we might be able to do with them. What you're looking at in these photographs here are solutions of these polymers. And the point here is to understand that through organic polymer chemistry, yeah. chalk talk, no. Uh, through organic polymer chemistry, what we can do is we can uh, control structure, control where molecules are going to absorb light, and that's going to control color. And this photograph here uh, are sprayed films or electrochromic polymers that I'll get into as we go along. OK. Uh, this is a picture of the research group at Georgia Tech. Um, what you can see is that um, it's a very happy bunch of people, and they're all doing outstanding work. And so I really do want to acknowledge the effort from the students and the postdocs. Uh, the work I'll talk about today, uh, especially funded through the Department of Defense, a long-term interaction with BASF, which has led to a new interaction with a small startup company and the Office of Naval Research here. All right. Now, people have been working on conjugated polymers, oligomers, molecules for a long time. And a question I think we need to ask ourselves is you know, where are their application to commercial products, to useful applications, really realistic? And if you're involved in this field for any length of time, you're going to run into many naysayers. People are going to ask you questions. Well, why do, you, do you think these will ever make it? Do you think these are going to be useful materials? And I think the, the point is emphatically yes. And uh, first off, if we just think about light emission, a huge amount of work went on through the years in organic molecules for light emission, polymer light emitting diodes. And this is a technology that has truly made it. And so in terms of cell phones, televisions, computer displays, OLEDs are reality. In the area of solar cells, there's a huge amount of work going on here in our, in our university, other places in organic solar cells. And of course, the work that um, led ultimately to this company, Canarca, to put forth these polyalkyl thiophene solar cells. I expect you're all very familiar with these. The company didn't make it, but they learned a significant amount in being generating those, those materials and those cells 
such that they really do have a technology that is potentially useful if, economically, they can get to that point. In electrochromism, viologens are electrochromic. These mirrors that you're looking at here are based on viologens dissolved in a gel. So it's organic electrochemistry. And this is a $1 billion a year sales business in what they call night vision safety electrochromic mirrors for automobiles. And so when you go down this, this line of potential applications over here, and you see things, for example, flexible displays or appliques for electrochromism and variable color displays, these things are all very, very realistic. And so I, was, I want to be encouraging to say that if you're working in this, in this area and you're looking at a fundamental problem in order to solve some material problem, ultimately, you have a very good chance of having something that is potentially useful. OK. Now, I started out life as a chemist. I am a chemist, and I like to use these words here. If molecular and polymer syntheses are the enabling science, then we need to really understand our chemistry. And so you can see the various units that we use in molecules, in polymers, to create electron-rich systems, electron-poor systems. They go through some kind of synthesis, ultimately a filter, to understand the properties of the materials such that these molecules may be, for example, surface reactive with phosphonic acids. There may be molecular systems. There may be polymer systems who are controlling the optoelectronic properties. But if we're really going to have materials that are useful, ultimately, we have to be able to process them, control the morphology, and really that is going to be what controls our ultimate success. Because you can make a fantastic polymer, fantastic molecule, but if you have not been able to control the properties of the material itself, well, you really are not able to understand what it is that you have. So one thing I like to talk about is what I call the processing gap. And I've said this to a few people so far while I visited today, is I really dislike spin coating. Spin coating is a very heterogeneous process. The idea being that we're taking a solution, we are placing that solution on this surface, and as that material is formed, it is going to be heterogeneous across that surface. And the morphology is going to be different at the center as opposed to the outside of that material you're making. So it really is different materials on different parts of the surface. Where we want to go in this field, is in this general area of roll-to-roll -roll coding and printing. And that is not a direct line in terms of experiments that we do over here with ultimately being able to make large area materials and devices. And so to do that, we need to bring in processing methods that we can use in the laboratory. We can do experiments that will be reproducible in morphology that will then be extendable to real processing printing type methods. And that's where things like blade coating, spray coating, et cetera, come in. And so this is something we've been working at quite a bit since I made the move five years ago to Georgia Tech. And so we use airbrush spraying and ultrasonic spraying, especially in our electrochromics areas. We use blade coating, inexpensive blade coating for obtaining smooth films, in situ monitoring of blade coating, especially in our OPV area. And I'll talk at the end of the talk today about a bit of inkjet printing. There are challenges there. As I said, we need to control and optimize the morphology. And something that's important to a number of us in the room is the scale of synthesis. It's really not enough to just go make 50 to 100 milligrams of something. But if we're going to be able to process it, we need to have at least access to large amounts. And I'll talk about 200 gram batches of stuff as we come along today. OK, so I'm going to really reach back in time and talk about a very simple reaction that we've used in conducting polymers basically forever. Now, this polymer repeat unit here, this is a dioxythiophene with a propylene bridge. I call it a prodot. So this is a dimethyl prodot. The polymer itself is made by an electrochemical polymerization of the monomer unit. It's then deposited in its charged and conducting form 
onto an electrode, might be a gold film, for example, with an electroactive polymer deposited in its charge state right there. We can then take those films that would be deposited on the charge, uh, in their charge states, and we can electrochemically reduce that film into its neutral state. And this electrochemistry between the dication state, the radical cation, which we can call polarons and bipolarons, is very reversible. Now if I take those two electrodes and I bring them together in an opposite charge, separated by an electrolyte, I have an electrochemical potential. I have a voltage that I can measure across here. And then if I allow that system to short, I can bring them to an equipotential. And in essence, what I'm doing here is I am charging and discharging the system, charging and discharging. And so we can look at this as a device that's potentially useful for charge storage. Now you'll hear a lot of talk about development in batteries. I don't see these materials being useful in batteries. They don't store enough energy. But the switching, this process can be quite rapid, as I'll show you. And the devices can have a form factor that can be, for example, quite thin. And so we can consider their use in supercapacitors. And so we'll talk about how these can be used in supercapacitors. So this one example of what we did with that electrochemically prepared polyprodot is we created bipolar electrodes that we could then bring multiple cells of these devices together. If we put two together in series, we can double the voltage. If we put them together in parallel, we can basically double the current or the capacitance of the system. And so we have the ability to make modules then that we can use to supply a voltage to a system. We can then drive power through some kind of a system. Okay, well electrochemical polymerization is not gonna go anywhere. We need to be able to have the ability to solution process these materials. But what we do know is that if we have these types of polymers, such as these phenylene dioxythiophenes or ethylene dioxythiophenes that we all know as EDOT, that they are very electrochemically active, very capacitive, but totally insoluble polymers. By placing substituents on here for solubilization, we have a very high level of electroactivity, but we lose a lot of the capacitive nature. So the question we asked, a very simple question, is can we design polymers that are soluble, but retain those redox properties of those electrochemically polymerized materials? And so we went into the toolbox of polymerizations that we might use. I expect you're all familiar with oxidative polymerizations, Green Yard Metathesis polymerizations, Suzuki Stille polymerizations. What we've found is that the direct air relation polymerization, the CH activation method, works very well for these dioxythiophenes. And so in this insta instance, we would use one of our units hydrogenated, the other unit air, uh, brominated or, or uh, halogenated, and a direct coupling to make polymers of relatively high molecular weight. So that's what we've done here. We've taken the dibromo prodot that's solubilizing, the dihydro prodot that is solubilizing. We can make what is in essence the homopolymer of polyprodot. We can carry out the copolymerization with E dot, the copolymerization with bi E dot. In, a, in our electrochromics program working with BASF, We've taken these polymerizations now up to 200 gram batches. And so it is very scalable chemistry, this direct air relation work. Molecular weights are on the order of 20 to 40,000 um, measured by GPC relative to polystyrene. Okay, so let's look at the electrochemical properties of this family of polymers. And what you can see is that polyprodot has an oxidation potential that's here at about 0.1 volts versus silver, silver plus. It's a relatively electron rich molecule. It oxidizes very easily, significantly easier than say a polyalkyl thiophene. But it is about a volt less easy to oxidize than P dot is. By bringing in these dioxythiophene units into the backbone, in essence what we're doing is we're bringing that oxidation potential down such at the point where we have the uh, one to two composition of the pro dot with the E dot, that we have created a polymer whose onset for oxidation is quite close to that, to P dot. And in fact, if we look at the cyclic voltammogram of P dot that's been deposited electrochemically with 
the PE2 that's been deposited by spray processing, you can see that the cyclic voltammograms are really pretty similar. In addition to the low onset for oxidation or the low oxidation peak here, you know, well south of zero volts, we have a significant amount of current that continues to higher voltage. And it's the, this capacitive charging that we want to use when we think about storing charge with these systems. So in order to understand this capacitive charging, we stole something from the, uh, from the organic photovoltaics community, from the solar community, and that is the idea of a fill factor. A perfect capacitor is going to have a rectangular IV response, in essence, a cyclic voltammogram. And so the question we ask ourselves then is, well, how well do we fill this rectangle with the cyclic voltammogram of one of these devices, and we call them type one supercapacitors, in which we have these two films facing each other across an electrolyte. Now, if we just take a commercial electrochemical supercapacitor, super it's uh, two carbon electrodes with acid electrolyte, what you can see is a fill factor on the order of 96%. If we electrochemically polymerize P dot and use an ionic liquid, we have a fill factor of 89%. And with this gel electrolyte that we tend to use for most of our simple devices, a fill factor on the order of 80%, electrochemically prepared. If we then go to our soluble polymers, polymers now that are spray coated out onto these uh, flexible electrodes, you can see when we start with a two to one ratio of the pro dot to the E dot, that we have a 65% fill factor. And you see a significant amount of form to this cyclic voltammogram. But as we increase that E dot content, we become more E dot like we become much more capacitive in that electrochemical response. And so this material, or this material is acting very much as a capacitive material with a fill factor on the order of 88%. So with that, we feel that what we've done is we've created what is in essence electrochemically a soluble P-dot. Now, the next step is to ask this question down here. These materials provide capacitance, but how about capacity? So far, I'm just talking about putting a thin film on a planar electrode. And so we turn to high surface area electrodes as the current carrying material. And we've, we've looked at a number of materials, a single wall carbon nanotube mats, carbon nanotube fours, RVC, and we've settled recently on carbon nanotube textiles. These carbon nanotube textiles are made as relatively large uh, mats of material. They're, they're not especially pure. We were talking earlier today about the purity in carbon nanotubes. And in fact, we have to clean these up quite a bit in order to have reproducible surface properties of the carbon nanotube textiles. But we're able to embed our polymers into them. Now, the next step is we'd like to be able to take these materials and make them or turn them into a situation where they will switch quite rapidly and can be used with aqueous electrolytes. And so we go back to, um, to the days of being able to make ionic polymers, conjugated polyelectrolytes. And so what you're looking at here is a you know, one to two po polymer here in terms of pro dot and E dot, but now we're using these functionalized benzoic acid esters. These polymers are organic soluble made by direct air relation polymerization. We isolate them, purify them as you would any organic soluble polymer. But what's interesting is you can take these polymers, place them into alcohol, and you can then saponify them to the carboxylate salts. And what's, what's nice then is these are water soluble. Isolate that and you have a water soluble polymer. So you can isolate this material, dissolve them up in water, and that would be the ink that you're going to process. You can see the water solubility in this picture down here. On the left hand side is the organic soluble polymer in chloroform, doesn't go into water. On the right hand side is the water soluble polymer, doesn't go into chloroform. Now, what an organic chemist knows is an organic chemist knows that benzoic acid is not a very water soluble compound. And so if we process that into a film and then treat that film with acid, we have a polymer that has four carboxylic acid groups and it becomes completely insoluble. It's insoluble in organic electrolytes, it's insoluble in organic solvents, it's insoluble in water and aqueous 
and aqueous electrolytes. And so we can then use aqueous electrolytes with these systems. And so here we're looking at some results from one of these thin film supercapacitors with these gold flat film current collectors using our solvent resistant polymer in which the data you're going to see here is using 0.5 molar sodium chloride and water as the electrolyte. Something very environmentally benign. What you can see here is we are switching this up to 10,000 millivolts per second and we're seeing a continual increase in the peak current in both lithium BTI and sodium chloride in water. So it's a very electroactive polymer in water and so we have a 100 millisecond charge discharge time for this film. If we then take that and look at the cyclical tamogram of the device, you can see it has a very nice uh, fill factor. You can see the rectangularity of that. And here what we're doing is uh, uh, switching this over 175,000 times for a device that was built out in the air and then put together. No special encapsulation or anything like that. And um, uh, only losing 25% of the electric electroactivity over that 175,000 cycles. And then I think the last thing I need to say about these is they're very conducive to use in many aqueous electrolyte systems. And so we've used saltwater, Gatorade and Powerade, basically the same stuff electrochemically, human serin and urine. And they switch, all, they switch very well in all of these. Now if we take those water-soluble polymers now. We want to deposit those onto the carbon textile. Again, here's an electron micrograph of that carbon textile, and there's a roll of the carbon textile material. We can embed that polymer into the textile by, for example, casting the polymer onto the textile and then saponifying inside the textile or first forming the water-soluble polymer and Im imbibing it into the textile. We find the bottom route actually is better due to the um, uh, hydrophobicity of the textile itself. And then we create one of these capacitors now uh, using graphite foil as a contact to, and that shouldn't, yeah, that, the, yeah the solvent resistant PE2 and oh, that's a carbon nanotube textile are the two blue things here. And then we have a cellulose separator um, in the system. And what you can see is we can then pile on 150 weight percent of the polymer onto the carbon nanotube textile. And you can see the increase in the overall capacitance from the system. And in this case, we took it out to 200 millivolts per second in terms of just demonstrating it would switch rapidly. So we've put these polymers onto textiles and we're also able to then encapsulate with plastic as the outer layers. And what you can see here in the galvanic discharging and charging, that after uh, 10,000 cycles, we've retained about 80% of the overall charge discharge abilities. You can see that they're very flexible. And uh, down here to um, on the order of a millimeter, we're bending these devices around a small um, millimeter pole and retaining the capacitance. And then we're able to bend these things on the order of thousands of times um, I believe this was around, yeah, bent around three and a half millimeters. And so there's a very good adhesion of the polymer onto that carbon nanotube textile and um, it retains its electroactivity. Okay, so I get to take a break. And so the first, the first break here is to say, okay, we've, we've made these polymers, demonstrated that with the solution processing, they're very electroactive and that we can have both organic processability and aqueous processability we can put them onto high surface area electrodes and have a significant amount of switching. One thing I'm very interested in is color and photography. And so this is a, a picture of me taking a picture of me and just some photographs I've taken of some pretty colors. The idea being that by controlling the optical properties of these redox active polymers, we can bring the electrochemistry and color control together. So let's talk about chromism for a few minutes. This is an example of chemochromism. Uh, the molecular structure is not on here, I'm sorry, but what this is, it's a molecule that has the structure thiophene with a phenylene, two E dots, phenylene, thiophene. And so we have six heterocycles together in a molecule, and that neutral molecule is yellow in color. 
Now, if we titrate in a colorless oxidizing agent, in this case, silver triflate, what we see is that this transition here in the blue is quenched or bleached, excuse me, as we form these two peaks, one in the visible, in the red, and one in the near infrared. And this is the formation of a cation radical. That cation radical in solution looks blue in color. And we've looked at that cation radical by EPR also. And so we can go back and forth between yellow and blue, and that's chemochromism. Now, what's important here is that we can then take nitrosonium hexafluorophosphate and we can oxidize that cation radical to the dication. And when we do, we see, first off, we've lost all of that neutral transition that was here in the blue. The peak for the cation radical disappears, and our dication now has absorbance only in the near infrared. And in fact, you can see through the entire visible a relatively flat color neutral, not transparent, but color neutral state. And that's that gray state right there. If we take that molecule and create an acrylate, then we have a way to make a coating. And so we take that molecule, we spray cast it from toluene onto an electrode surface uh, in the presence of some free radical initiator, anneal that to dry it, and then cross-link wherever we want to with a UV lamp, and then wash away what hasn't been cross-linked. You're looking at uh, films here of that polymer film that's been deposited or sprayed on ITO glass. And now what you're looking at is electrochromism. We are switching from that neutral form to the cation radical form. You see the two peaks, one in the visible, one in the infrared. And then we take it farther out in terms of electrochemical potential, the cation radical to the dication, and we end up with a state that is relatively, again, color neutral. So that's the electrochromic effect. Because we've used an acrylate, because we're able to pattern, we can also mask. And so we can create some kind of a display then that will switch between colors. This yellow form that's neutral, the blue cation radical form, and now this color neutral form. But like I say, it's not transmissive. It's not fully transparent. You can still see that light gray color. And that's something we've been working on quite a bit and I'll talk about as we go along. Okay, so with that, what we want to do now is bring this fully conjugated polymer approach to being able to control the properties of these electrochromic polymers. And I, I think this is a, a type of structure you'll see in lots of these types of um, presentations where we have a main chain where we're controlling the optical properties. In our case, it's what we call coarse color control. Um, we have in almost all of our systems dioxythiophenes to keep the HOMO high so they'll be oxidized very easily. And then various substituents that give us that solubility. So this is a set of polymers we developed over a number of years. <coughs> what you're looking at is you're looking at photographs of the films that have been deposited, spray deposited, onto ITO glass. You're looking in a cuvette in a UV vis near IR. And so you can see a, a platinum wire counter electrode in the, in the cuvette. You can see the frit from a reference electrode. And this is where we're going to be looking at the electrochromism, for example. But the idea being that as a function of the structure, for example, a, uh, uh, an alternating polymer of a prodot with a phenylene, a high gap polymer will be yellow to your eye. If we come over here, where we take that same prodot, but now carry out the polymerization with an electron uh, poor benzothiodiazole, we bring the LUMO down, we close the gap in the system, and we have a transmission window in the blue or the cyan, and that material is going to be blue to your eye. So it's the way we're controlling color in all of these systems. We go back to that same electrochemistry now that I was talking about for the dimethyl polyprodot. Here we are with a film of dimethyl polyprodot that's been electrochemically deposited. In the neutral form, it's purple in color. It has its absorbance through the visible right here. As we oxidize it, we form the cation radicals and dication states. And what you can see in this polymer now, this dimethyl polyprodot, is that the dication form, or the bipolaron form, is very strongly absorbing in the infrared. 
And now we have very little light absorbance through the visible, and it's quite flat. And this becomes significantly more transmissive. It's still not a transparent polymer, but significantly more transmissive. And so with that, in these soluble polymers, our yellow polymer can go transmissive, our orange polymer transmissive, red, purple, all these go transmissive. Now we use this A star, B star color plot as a way of keeping up with what's happening in the colors. And so let me talk you through this because we'll use these. The idea being that your eye is a nonlinear detector. And the sensitivity to color is a function of the wavelength of light. And so what we can do is take a spectrum and break it down to how your eye will respond and apply color coordinates of red to green. So positive A, red, negative A, green, positive B, yellow, negative B, blue, and then determine where, this, where any material sits in those color coordinates. And then, as we change the electrochemical potential to that film, for example, for this red material, we can track the color track as that material goes from being very vibrant red ultimately to a color neutral, and in this case, a transmissive, transmissive film. So let's go through a few of these just to kind of give you a feel for how we work through this kind of a project. And Let's start with what I call ECP yellow one. That's that alternating polymer of the pro dot with the phenylene. What you can see is the polymer is very nicely yellow in its neutral form. It goes to a relatively transmissive state in its oxidized form. It takes about 1.1 volts to get there. It's a bit of a high voltage. When we compare the ability for that yellow polymer to become transmissive relative to, say, our cyan and magenta polymers, you can see that there is remnant color in that yellow polymer. And that's because what you're trying to do is you're trying to take this absorption in the neutral form and move it out here in the oxidized form. So you need to push it all the way out into the near IR. So how are we going to approach color control? Now, some of you might know that uh, we recently at Georgia Tech hired a young theoretical chemist. His name is Jean-Luc Breda. Very, we're very glad Jean-Luc is coming back. Um, over this last couple of years, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with Amay Tomlinson from the University of North Georgia. So, in order to control color, we could do computational chemistry. And so, Amay carried out some calculations, and there are things that we can learn from computational chemistry in terms of understanding the properties of our systems, uh, positions of homos and lumos and band gaps and bond lengths and angles, but we really are not to the point where we can determine what the color of the material will be because the width of the transitions, not just their location, but the width of the transitions are so important. So, so far, computational determination of color is out. What else can we do? We can go to physical organic chemistry. Physical organic chemistry. And I, for years, had the opportunity to work with Alan Kotritsky, a, a great heterocycle chemist working with paroles and thiophenes, etc. I think we've all heard of Lewis Hammett and how electron donating, electron withdrawing groups can affect the chemistry on aromatic species. We could go to this physical organic approach. But sometimes, you just want to throw the kitchen sink at a problem. And that's what this student, Justin Kurzulis, did. Justin just said, well, I like to make things. So Justin said, I'm going to make a bunch of things that I think are yellow, or going to be yellow, and then we'll go back and we'll figure out what has happened. And so Justin made the um, alternating polymers of ProDot with carbazole, with fluorine, dialkoxybenzenes, uh, and pyrenes, et cetera. So we obtain these materials, and we're looking at the properties of materials. And we learn, and we do learn something. What you can see here are photographs and color coordinates of these molecules that go from yellow through to this, to this orange. And if we take, for example, the prodot carbazole polymer, what you can see is it has a, um, uh, an A star of minus 10. It's a little on the to the left here, a little on the green side, but a very strong B star, it's way up here. And so that polymer is very yellow to your eye. If, on the other hand, we take a dimer of prodot with 
the phenylene, where the, where the monomer of prodot and phenylene was very yellow, you can see that we've moved down in this, in this diagram to become significantly more red. In fact, we, we call this polymer ECP peach because it's one of the first polymers we made in Georgia. Okay, some people got that. That's good. All right. So what we did learn is we learned that this polymer, this peach-colored polymer, had a lower electrochemical potential because it had two prodots relative to one phenylene, was much more electrochemically stable. And so we then went in and opened up the prodot ring by using acyclic dioxythiophenes, which brings a bit more steric hindrance in relative to the polyprodot. And so we, we brought the band gap of that peach polymer back up and brought that polymer into the yellow space and made a very definitive yellow polymer, which now at 300 millivolts less than the original ECP yellow, went into the, the fully transmissive state. So, these physical organic chemistry approaches can work as we think about what to do with them. So let's think now about how we might control our redness. And part of what we're doing, frankly, was practical. Because you might have seen I talked about ECP yellow 1 and ECP yellow 2. Because we want to have the best material we can use for those colors of cyan, magenta, and yellow, ultimately for printing. And when we started working with polyprodot, we called that ECP magenta 1. But after switching, you can see that that's not magenta. That's really more of a purple. And so if we look at that family of polymers with the E dots, what you can see is that by, <coughs> excuse me, by bringing in a bit more steric distortion into the system, we can blue shift the absorbance a little bit, which is going to allow a little bit more red light to pass through. And what that does is that increases the strain down the backbone of the magenta, one, such that it becomes more red. As it becomes more red, it becomes more magenta to your eye. And so we're able to chemically now tune in this magenta color. How about if we want to go towards the blue? Here we are again with this polyproda in the purple. Now what we're going to do is we're going to relax those steric interactions by using E dot. We're going to allow the polymer to have a more long wavelength absorption. We're going to capture that red light. We're going to allow the blue light through. And so you see that the purple polymer now is moving over to the blue. To ultimately, we have polymers that are distinctly blue. So let's look at this, uh, uh, this pro dot, E dot, pro dot, by E dot, et cetera. And so here you're looking at the absorption spectra, sorry, the transmission spectra of this biprodot by E dot polymer relative to what we originally called our ECP blue, which was that alternating polymer that I talked about earlier with the benzothiodiazole. And now we have a polymer that is significantly more saturated in blue. You see a negative 60 on the B star plot as opposed to a negative 42 on the B star plot. It's closer to zero. In fact, this polymer is really more of a cyan color than it is a blue. It also gave us a higher level of transmission because it is just a dioxythiophene polymer. It oxidizes easier than the polymer that has the benzothiodiazole in the backbone. So we went through this for a lot of polymers, and I don't want to belabor the point today. What I do want to do, ah, good, is find the find the clock here. Okay, what I do want to do then is, is tell you how we can use these materials ultimately in a device. And so what you can see here is we've taken two pieces of ITO glass and we've coated our polymer on both sides. And let's use again a symmetrical device like I did in the supercaps. And we're going to place between them now a white diffuse reflecting gel electrolyte. We took titania and stirred it into the electrolyte. So when there's a negative bias on the front electrode, this polymer is in its neutral form. If it's the magenta polymer, it's going to look magenta to your eye. The polymer that's biased positive is in its transmissive form. If we then switch the bias on the device, 
then what's going to happen is this is going to go in the clear state, transmissive state. This will go into its colored state, but you won't see the color because we've hidden it behind the white diffuse reflecting gel electrolyte. And what you're going to see is you're going to see that reflection off of the titania. And so what we're thinking here is that this electrochromic device now is what you would in essence imagine to be a pixel for the possibility of a color display, like a Kindle. And you can see from this specific device on the order of 60% uh, reflectivity across the visible in this state. And then we're absorbing through here, and that's what's creating that magenta color um, uh, in the black curve. And in fact, we brought my Kindle in, which was one of the early generation Kindles, and the reflectivity off of my Kindle in the white state was just about the same. So very similar in terms of the optical properties. Now, one question that comes up is, how rapidly is this going to occur? You know, think about, think about a Kindle. Think about a book you're reading. If you have something that switches its color, switches its display in half a second, you're relatively happy. One, one thou. One, one thou. That's OK. But if you have to wait three seconds for something to switch, you're bored. One, one thousand. Two, one thousand. Three, one thousand. Oh. One, one thousand. That's just not going to work. So. These things switch pretty fast. So here we are switching one of these devices in a second. And here we are switching the device every quarter of a second. And so we can get down to about 100 milliseconds with this regular electrolyte with titania and get the full switch out of the material. We are, we are not going to get microsecond switching out of these kinds of electrochromic, electrochemical devices, but getting down into the the millisecond range really is feasible. OK, so I've showed you how chemically we can make colors. But what we've done is we've made now a cyan polymer, the second magenta polymer, and the second yellow polymer. And these are inks. And so we can mix the colors together in order to obtain colors we might want. Because we know if you take a solution of magenta and yellow, you get red. If you take magenta and cyan, you get blue. And those are, those are solutions. And if we take films of these materials, for example, if we take an orange film and a cyan film, if we blend those polymers together, then we can make a brown film. If we take an orange with a blue that has more red in it, we can make an orange brown film. So we have a lot of color control by mixing these various materials together. Now, I'm at Georgia Tech, just to the south of our campus is this big building with the Coca-Cola sign on top, because that's where their world headquarters is. And so I said, hey, guys, let's see if we can get some money from Coke. So what we did is we went and bought a box of Coke, and we cut out their cardboard box, that's their cardboard box, took our spectrophotometer, measured the color coordinates, that's the color coordinates of Coke Red. And then we took our yellow, I'm sorry, our orange, and our, and our red polymer brought them together in the proper composition and basically tuned in a coke red, which was electrochromic. And then this would be switchable to clear. And this is not, of course. And coke didn't bite. So <laughs> it was worth a try. The color that people really are interested in is black. They'd love to be able to have windows that go from black to clear, glasses that go from black to clear, visors that go from black to clear. This is a bit of an extreme experiment, but it shows you how this can work. We took four polymers, cyan polymer, what we called our periwinkle two polymer, magenta two and yellow two. We had a lot of fun naming our polymers, peach, periwinkle, et cetera. But the point here is if we blend these together in the proper ratio, we can get the transmittance spectrum that you have here in this dashed line. So from 400 nanometers to out to near 800 nanometers, a very flat, very absorbing material. If you look down here in the lower right, in the neutral form, you see color coordinates of 0 minus 5. Very close to the center, very color neutral, black. But they're electrochromic. And so if we then switch that polymer into the oxidized state, we go into this transmissive state here. And again, you can see it's very color neutral. Now, what I'm comparing to here in the solid line is a homopolymer, a random a random polymer, actually a random copolymer that we made. And this demonstrates how the blackness of the material can be controlled by using these blends. 
let's talk about an application on how we might use our color matching to give us an aesthetically pleasing color. So this is Anna Osterholm's sunglasses. Anna's a postdoc in the group. And you might remember her father. Um, forget his first name, but he worked here. Osterholm worked here many, many years ago, Fred. Um, so Anna is now a postdoc in my group. And we took her sunglasses and we measured the color coordinates on her sunglasses. Then we determined how we could mix together our orange and periwinkle polymers such that we could match the absorbance spectrum of her sunglasses with our ECP blend. And what was especially important in using this periwinkle polymer had to do with the band gap and the ability to set that onset right at the same point as those sunglasses. And so here you're looking at a photograph of the sunglass lens, which is made by our ECP Brown, a UV curable electrolyte, and a charged storage polymer that doesn't undergo much color change at all. And so here they are in action. Here's the, the device when it's held at minus one volts relative to the, um, uh, the ECP it's in its dark state. When we then bring it to an intermediate voltage, the periwinkle is a more electron-rich polymer than the orange polymer, and so it oxidizes first, and we go into an intermediate orange state, and then finally at one volt, we go into the nice transmissive state that you can see in the absorbent spectrum right there. And so if you think about transition lenses, and you think about photochromism, where you typically think about times out of the order of many, many seconds, maybe minutes, these electrochromic switches are really very rapid, like I showed you in the reflective devices. Okay, so I think the last thing that I want to discuss today brings us back to the processing aspect. And the idea that we would like to use these in some kind of printable display, and so we'll come over to inkjet printing. And one of the reasons I like to show this, especially to an audience with graduate students that are in the presence of their advisors, is that advisors can be really terrible. Because you bring in something you think is really cool, really interesting, and they immediately go for the problem. And so these guys go print these on the inkjet printer. So here's our cyan polymer, our magenta polymer, and our yellow polymer printed. 150 micron dots that they've printed with these polymers. And the first thing I say is, well, why is the magenta not homogeneous like the yellow and the cyan? I go right to that. But then you stop and you say, well, what is 150 micron dot? Well, 150 micron dot is about the size of a Times New Roman six point period. So go, you know, go home tonight, print on a piece of paper, a Times New Roman six point period and just pick it up and look at it. That's what that dot is. And here we printed some Times New Roman six point periods on a piece of um, old transparency using an office laser printer, and that's what they look like in the microscope. They're about, these were about 200 microns across, and they weren't very pretty looking. So all of a sudden, these dots look a lot better. So you print a dot. All right, if you print a dot, you're gonna print arrays of dots. And so here we've printed an array of cyan dots, an array of magenta dots, an array of yellow dots. And if we can print dots, then we can bring those dots closer together. We can print lines. If we can print lines, we can then bring the lines together and we can print pixels. And so we're to the point now where these are about one millimeter pixels that are electrochromic and could be printed wherever we would want. So we can print pixels basically of any size from a few hundred microns out to larger. I'll just skip this. It just shows the, I think I've belabored coupler enough. Just finish with this. Okay. So what you're looking at here is you're looking at a comparison of inkjet printed films and spray coated films. And the, the photography here is not especially good in the large films, but it's, uh, it's uh, relatively good inside. And what you're looking at here is you're looking inside a cuvette. You're looking at, you know, on the order of seven millimeters by about, what is that, about uh, 15, 20 millimeters that has been printed using the inkjet and now you can see the electrochromism. And so the yellow is going clear, magenta clear, and the cyan to clear. Very similar to the spray coating. Okay, good. Well, hopefully, 
what you're going to take away from this today is, is first off, there's a lot we can do with electrochemistry with these electron-rich polymers. I've used charge storage and color switching, electrochromism is just the examples today. But there's so many things we can do with these ionically active materials. The second thing hopefully you've learned is that we can control the properties over a very wide range with the backbone structure. We can control the physical properties by the side chains, organic processability, water processability, water insolubility, when we want it to be that way. And then once we have those materials and we've got the basic function down, we really need to turn to processing in order to figure out what to do with them. And so I think with that, I'll just stop, say thank you for inviting me, and if any questions. Um, first is this combination of accessing the colors with the proper stability in long-term switching. So our ECP yellow one, which was the first yellow to clear organic electrochrome, was developed in 2011. Our polymer switched maybe 50 to 100 times before we lost contrast that made it useful. We then came to ECP yellow 2 with the two AC dots. That would be around 2013. And we've gone now to 1,000 cycles. Our magenta polymer switches between 10 and 100,000 cycles very easily. And if you think about the kinds of applications that you would want, if you're going to be talking about a disposable, a few hundred to 1,000 is a good place to be. If you're going to be talking about, say, uh, uh, glasses or something you want around for a few years, then 10,000 is where you want to be. So really, it's been a materials limited problem where the people involved in electrochromism have not developed the proper colors and materials that we've been working on. They've been using metal oxides, which are fine for windows. They're blue. They're slow. They're very durable. They do what they do. They've worked on viologens which are blue or green. But this ability to get to the whole color palette has not existed until now with this, this kind of set of materials. Do you think that, that ever will be cost competitive because they're you know, more complex? Well, it all depends on what you're cost competitive with. And so in, in terms of the cost of the polymer, relative to putting it into a disposable card, that you would use for a simple display, they're very cost competitive. There's a company in um, Portugal, their name is Invisible, that, uh, that basically have these things coming along in terms of the electronics and the ability to switch these materials. So I, I think the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah. Well done, thank you very much. Well done, thank you very much for uh, Terrific talk and an enormous amount of work. Not by you, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I do feel bad when I put up the slide of colors and it's five, ten years of synthesis, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. All of us downplay the, the synthesis because we're so much more interested in the ultimate goal of, you know, either color mixing or, or whatever. Anyway, just some very couple technical questions. Uh, you probably remember that dibromo E dot is rather unstable, right? And it yes. spontaneously polymerizes. I'll tell you guys the story later if you want to know. Anyway, so what about dibromo E dot? Uh, sorry, pro dot. Dibromo pro dot. The dibromo pro dot does not undergo the same spontaneous or topotactic polymerization as dibromo E dot. Uh -huh. And certainly, we worked at it. The dibromo E dot with the alkyl chains yeah. uh, do not. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. So it's probably uh, uh, the fact that you need to be very closely packed. 
yes. in the solid state. I mean, you, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you showed that yeah, in yeah, terms of yeah. the ability of those bromines to get close enough. Right. Okay, then my last question was, what's the conductivity of the carbon nanotube textile? You know? No, I have not measured it. But it's on the order of ITO or less or more? I expected it's less, but I, I, really, it's I really don't know. Um, okay. What I can tell you is that with a stainless steel or a graphite sheet contact, that it behaves as an effective electrode for switching. There's, enough, there's certainly more, more than enough conductivity to get our polymer switching very fast, but we haven't measured it. Oh. But it must be known someplace, right? Yeah. But we could go home and measure it if we wanted. <laughs> we, we can say the number next week. We can measure okay. it. Um, right. You know, and when I, said conduct, when, I, when I said conductivity, I meant conductivity. It's, it's surface resistance may be close to that of a thin film of ITO, but yeah. I certainly think its conductivity is lower. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Could you comment on the polymer electrolyte you're using between the counter electrode and your electrochromic device? And also, and also, I noticed on your, I noticed on your supercapacitors with your capacitors, you had like one amp, I think, per gram or half a gram. Is that for the uh, electrolyte side or the whole polymer? Okay. So, yeah, so I'll, well, I'll answer the first one first. The, <clears throat> the, the gram is for the mass of the polymer itself, for the polymer itself, the whole, the whole polymer. Yes, yeah, so we, we consider the whole polymer with the side chains. And in fact, one of the reasons for coming up with these cleavable side chains is to get some of that mass out and so that ultimately we would have a higher uh, capacitance, farads per gram, in the ultimate materials. Okay, so that's, that's that question. Um, as far as the electrolytes are concerned, um, we've used a number of different electrolytes. Our go-to electrolyte is, is very simply a solution of propylene carbonate with polymethyl methacrylate and lithium salt to a viscosity. That's basically what, occur, what we call our gel electrolyte. Now we've also used the Iano gels from Tim Lodge's group. They work very well. And they're, they're nice because you can cut them and laminate them into our devices. They work fine. And uh, we've used UV curing gels that are acrylates that have oligoether chains in between them uh, so we can set to a semi-solid. The problem with those, we find, is that there's a, um, a long-term curing and their conductance goes down with time with exposure to light. And so they, they end up kind of locking up. I, I don't have those numbers in, I really don't have those numbers in mind, I'm sorry. Yeah, I can get them, we have them. They're in various slides, I don't have them right there. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh. So you show some switching time of uh, your device. So is that the material properties or the, the device properties that you process and change? In the yeah, that's, that's a very good question. <laughs> switching time is a function of the electrode and the device. And so if we're, looking at an, if we're looking at an electrode for a certain switching time, we would mainly use that to compare between systems in the same situation. If we're looking at it in a device, then it is the, real, the potential of the real application of that device. And so, for example, with that movie that I showed you, I think that if we wanted to make a display that had multiple pixels on it, and we were going to drive each pixel separately, then in the 10 to 50 millisecond range, we could drive those pixels fully. But I don't think we're going to get to a microsecond. Yeah. Um, 
little hand waving now, right? <coughs> but <coughs> but the, 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 the gist in general is that when we, um, <coughs> when we use a, a polyprodot and we have the substituents that are pointing above and below the ring, right? We're at a tetrahedral carbon where we substitute then that means that those chains don't easily pack as they do in, say, a p-dot. And so when you go into the fully oxidized form, that long wavelength tail is pushed into the infrared. It doesn't swing back into the visible nearly as much. And so I think it's this, this intermolecular interaction of the charges that are, in essence, delocalized not just on the single chain, but on multiple chains. And we break them up with the polyprodots. And so the polyprodots are much more transmissive than p-dot. And in, in fact, the, the way we got onto this was <coughs> we tried to make an organic soluble p-dot. So we made p-dot C14. And so we put, it, we put a, this tetradecyl chain on E-dot and polymerize it oxidatively. And the student came in with a photograph of the oxidized form, and I told him he had something wrong because it was so clear. Now, unfortunately, that polymer, the E-dot e polymers, are very unstable in their neutral form to oxi just air, air oxidation compared to the prodots. And so when we found the prodots, all the substituted E dot stuff went away because handling them is really difficult. So you think it's an optical transition, but it's not fully controlled as opposed to scattering or other kind of phenomena? As far as the, that's a good point. As far as the long wavelength absorption is concerned, yes. Now, let's take it to the next level. And that is all of our polymers, I don't care what they are, no matter how transmissive we form them, if their neutral form has an absorbance of about 1 AU, which is where we spray to in the, at the peak, the, the oxidized form is between 0.05 and 0.1 AU no matter what we do. So there's, there is some absorption that is going on through the visible, and I'm not sure what that is. You know, it, it doesn't. Um, the, uh, I don't know that I can give you a, you know, a, a long reason for that, but what I can just tell you is it, it doesn't. Um, these polymers all switch at about the same speeds, probably because they're all dioxythiophene based. They're all swollen with the salt and the electrolyte more or less the same. and the, the physical processes that are going on are all very similar. And so the, the perturbations of how much twist we've got is not affecting it at that level. So this reminds me of way back in the dark ages of this field where we mostly have bodies that wasn't even born yet. <laughs> That's the one who made the polyisobiomaphic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. It would probably be worth a revisit to go back and see just how far down you can drive the absorption in the oxidized form in the visible.
we are, like a small piece of that. Mm -hmm. But when we're approaching to do some variety of patients in a way that is trying to make identical color, um, but not like looking into different small and the combination of the big picture. Is there any limitation of making a more piece of one individually like we do with the mouthpiece? Because I know that the electronic Yeah, I think I think first off, it's a very good. There's a number a number of very good points you're bringing up. I think you've kind of wound some questions in together, and the the first point is being that they're color changing and not emissive materials where the emission is going to radiate outwards. You you're not going to get the color vibrancy as you're going to get, say, from an OLED. You're going to be, you could use these as color filters in which you would backlight and, and carry out a filter. They, in essence, that's the pictures that I did show was a white light behind, behind these things. The next point in terms of the processing, you're looking at the paper we published last year. It's the first time they've ever been inkjet printed to even get to those 150 micron features. And so if someone were to pick them up and have flexible backplane TFTs where they wanted to drive the electrochromism, they could do that. But you're only going to fill a certain area of that device. And you're not going to get the glow like you do out of a light emitting device. So I don't think you're going to apply that same technology there. Okay. So let's thank John for